Jeff Brotman got a law degree so that he wouldn't have to work in his dad's store. Still, somewhere along the way, he ended up co-founding a national retail empire. Costco is famous for the $400 million in toilet paper it sells a year and the $1.50 hot dog and soda special that hasn't changed in price since 1985. But beyond all the good value, it's Jeff's good values that endear Costco's nearly 70 million members to the company. This may irritate Wall Street, yet it's also what has made Costco such a success and Jeff Brotman such a good civic citizen in the Pacific Northwest. That's why he joins our exclusive list of The Innovators. I'm Hanson Hossein. Welcome to Four Feeds. So, Jeff Brotman from Costco, welcome. Thank you. So, how did you get dragged back into retail? <laughs> well, uh, a lot of what you said is true. I, uh, I got bored with retail, working in uh, the dregs of summer in my dad's uh, clothing stores. And so, um, I decided I ought to be a professional and I went to law school because I couldn't stand the sight of blood and go to med school. So, I ended up in law school and, um, and uh, practiced law for a few years and uh, was very interested in having other businesses during those periods and surrounded myself um, either consciously or unconsciously with other like-minded uh, lawyers and non-lawyers. And um, so the first um, entrepreneurial activities that I did were small unit retail uh, stores in the Pacific Northwest, along with uh, friends and, and my brother, who uh, is also a retailer. So uh, it was a pretty natural way to go. And eventually, as I did more uh, business startups, uh, I uh, spread my wings and got into other avenues. It reminds me a little bit of Al Pacino, and I think it was Godfather 3, where they, every time I try to get out, they keep dragging me back in. Is there something in the Brotman genetic code that says thou shall do retail regardless of what you want to do? Absolutely. Every, uh, well, many generations in my family have been in retail. All of, uh, all of my relatives on both sides, my mom and dad's sides, we're in some form of retail. Uh, my kids are in retail. My brother's in retail. Aunts and uncles are in retail. So I guess there's some DNA in there that uh, guided me. In truth, uh, before I started Costco, I was actually involved in the oil exploration business. Uh, but of course, oil prices went into the um, uh, toilet in the early 80s. And so I was looking around for something to do. My dad says, retail. <laughs> and uh, so I was doing a big research project at that time relative to large format retail because I didn't want to uh, run small unit clothing stores like my dad did because it was pretty boring. So how did you know that the Costco model and idea that you developed was the right time to, to sort of come to fruition? Well, some of it is intuition, but a lot of it is um, uh, professional judgment and, and, and research. Uh, at that time in the Northwest uh, and in other parts of the country, the grocery business, as an example, was very uncompetitive. Uh, the stores were dirty. They didn't have great products. The prices were quite high. Uh, for example, in the greater Seattle area, Safeway stores at that time had almost a 60% market share. So there was very little competition. Uh, and as a result, there was a price umbrella. So I saw that as an opportunity uh, if we could develop a concept that was more romantic than a typical grocery store that was lower priced, we certainly in the grocery end or the food end uh, could really build a strong franchise if we did that. And of course, I was interested in the non-food side because I wanted a larger format than the normal grocery store. And did you have, I'm just going to play a little video just to show a little bit behind the scenes. Obviously, every, most people know what a Costco looks like now, but at the outset, did you have this principle that there would be no more than a 15% markup for on all products that were sold in the Costco? Well, we developed that. There was several things going on around the world in the retail format and the wholesale format. One of them was a hypermarket concept that was very highly developed in Europe at the time. Um, and they were very, very good at food uh, because of the way people were used to buying food locally. So the hypermarkets uh, were very romantic in the way they approached the food uh, uh, marketing, if you will. And they were very, very poor relative to U.S. Uh, non-food retailers in the non-food section. And I thought that 
if somehow we could combine this, uh, we would have a winning uh, formula because Americans were more attuned to higher quality products than they were in the non-food area in, uh, than they were in Europe. On the other hand, Americans were not as fine-tuned on the food, fresh food side, as the Europeans were. Given they, the culture of Europe has with food, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. And this, this was also the same in Asia, where fresh pr uh, uh, food products are, are key. Uh, in addition to that, there was a new wholesale concept that was established in San Diego. This called, is Price Club, this right? This is Price Club. Yeah. And what they did is they copied a, a German uh, cash and carry format that was wholesale only. And they were uh, originally failing in that uh, it just didn't s seem to translate into the U.S. market. And I was watching what they were doing, and, and as they began to become more retail in their orientation, they became more successful. I mean, you've mentioned, you've actually used the word romantic a couple times in relation to retail, which is not exactly how I would normally associate the two words, but even looking at a Costco compared to, say, a Safeway now, there's something very highly functional about Costco in terms of using pallets and, 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 and natural lighting and, and just really bare bones. But yet there's this passion, uh, I wouldn't go as far as romance, but there's definitely a passion that customers have. What have you done in this content that you've created that has created that amazing connection between customer and Costco? Well, it's, uh, it's a secret. Uh, no, it's <laughs> not a secret. But uh, what we've tried to do is figure out how many products could we put into one building, if you will, and have each product in a way be irresistible. Now you can call it irresistibility, um, which is fine. I think that what we try to do is to create an environment that is straightforward for, the, for our members, for customers. And um, I think that we do the selection for the customer in many instances. As you know, although we carry a large number of product categories, Within a category, it's a very narrow selection, if any. If you want to buy a toaster, you can buy w the toaster we have. If you don't like that, you're not going to buy a toaster from us. But we think we bought the best toaster and the one with the best value. If you go into the fresh product sections now, now remember we're 30 years old and we have developed, uh, we've gotten better over the last 30 years. Um, we think that uh, through working with uh, countries and growers domestically and internationally, we have the best uh, fresh products that you can buy. And of course, the value equation is enormous. You know, we're going to talk about the value in those values when we get back, because I think that's really what really is a secret to your success. So we'll be right back with Jeff Brotman from Costco. back with Jeff Brotman from Costco. Jeff, you, you were talking about this notion of that you, you actually select the products that people want. There's almost this assurance of quality. Um, when you go to the average supermarket, you're faced with so much choice that it actually becomes a stressful environment for the person. Well, Costco is almost acting like a trusted filter, that people trust Costco to choose the right items that they can actually put their faith in. That's, that's absolutely the case. What we do is we spend an enormous amount of time in mundane areas like uh, cereal, uh, breakfast cereal. If you go to a breakfast cereal um, the area of a grocery store or any other store, uh, you'll find um, maybe 30 or 40 or 50 uh, brands. You'll find multiple sizes within each of those brands. And really, it, it's a daunting uh, experience if you really don't know exactly what you want. What we do for you in that in, in the cereal ca category and every other category is we get into the market, we look at what we think is um, the best quality and the best value and of course the best taste in, in the food area. And we make those choices for people and obviously we don't have a hundred percent market share in any food product as an example. But uh, a lot of people uh, would rather have us do that pre-selection for them uh, than to have to go through the stress of going to the, to the grocery store. The side benefit of that is that we become the largest retailer of that particular cereal in the world because that's all we're selling. Some of your best practices such as that uh, endear you to your customers but also 
drive your analysts crazy. I mean, sure. they don't want you to pay your employees that much. They don't want you to have more products. You know, how, how have your personal values driven the ethic and culture of Costco? Well, when we uh, when we started the company, uh, we mimicked uh, the way we were raised, and uh, we mimicked the way our parents uh, treated our, the employees in our stores. And uh, where did that come from? Because I understand, I, I believe that at least with your your parents and your grandparents, their faith played quite a bit in terms of how they thought their duty was to society and their community. Yeah, I think that we were all raised uh, both in terms of our faith, uh, but in terms of common sense and decency. Uh, maybe we, maybe it's hard to tell whether the chicken or the egg came first in, in that environment. But uh, I, I always grew, I grew up with uh, seeing my father have um, uh, compassion for the employees. And so the, uh, even my dad, this is back in the 50s uh, when I was growing up and working as a little kid in the stores. Um, we just took care of the employees. It, it wasn't a function of having mandated requirements of uh, minimum wage, uh, medical insurance, and all of these things. Uh, Dad took care of all of the employees. If an employee was sick, or if there was a, a death in the family, or you know any variety of things, you treated that employee just the way you would treat family. And uh, same with uh, my partner Jim. Uh, grew up in that same environment. Um, so how do you find the fortitude to resist the pressure from Wall Street that loves to see you cut employees and cut wages, um, they, they, but yet you manage to, to show success regardless? Well, um, the reason that we were able to do that is that we didn't really care about Wall Street. Uh, even though we went public very early in the, our corporate existence because we needed to be able to compete with the Walmarts of the world. Um, we felt that we had the duty to build a company and treat our employees right and treat the community right. And uh, whatever happened, happened. We happen to believe that you can do a variety of things. You can treat your employees well. You can treat your members well. Uh, you can treat your suppliers well. And at the end of the day, your shareholders will be rewarded. That's a very long-term view. That is a view that doesn't exist on Wall Street even today. And a lot of the problems of American business today are laid at the feet of Wall Street because it's quarter by quarter pressure. In our case, I guess it's easy to say that we didn't care because we were we made vast fortunes over many, many years as a result of sticking to those principles. So it's easy to say for me to say, oh, okay, you know, this is the way you ought to do it. But I'm a founder. Uh, they weren't going to fire me, probably. They weren't going to fire my partner, Jim. And we felt uh, uh, very comfortable and, and confident that we could carry out a mission that is unusual. Well, we'll be right back with Jeff Broppin to talk about how this region fed some of those values as well. We're back with Jeff Brotman from Costco. Jeff, um, we've spoken about your values and your success. Part of your success also revolves around the fact that the average Costco customer or member, you know, makes a six-figure salary, they're college educated. Um, how do you reconcile that with the idea that you would like this to be as accessible as possible? I imagine that plays into your values as well, that you would like as many people as possible to come shop at Costco and get those benefits. It's, it's a bit of a, a conundrum for us, but we, uh, we think that this business model uh, uh, requires high quality uh, products. And oftentimes, high quality uh, does not mean cheap. It means great, great value. So as an example, uh, we sell dome, we're the largest retailer of Dome Perignon in the world. We champagne. sell it champagne. So uh, let's just say on average, we sell it for $100 a bottle. Uh, there, are very, there aren't that many people who are prepared to spend $100 on champagne, but it's a great value. It's probably half pr the price that they would pay elsewhere. Um, so in a way, the merchandise selects out a, a certain customer group. So if you're not able to buy New York steaks, even if it's the best value in the United States, if you're not able to step up and buy uh, 
that type of product, then you're not going to get the value of the membership. So uh, what happens is, is the merchandise selects the member. So are you content to leave that other part of the market to say Walmart, even as they have their own competition, which is Sam's Club to Costco? We are. Um, we are not very capable people. We can only do one thing right. And uh, we felt that it was important to focus on uh, those products and those product categories. And uh, we weren't going to have 100% market share. We knew that going in. And so we had to leave the rest of the market behind. And as you know, we have a niche. And when you look at this region, we got Costco, Nordstrom, Starbucks, Amazon, very customer-centric companies that also seem to have a very strong core set of values. Is there something about this region that feeds that, or was, you know, was Costco and Nordstrom the first to sort of set that tone and the rest have followed? I think that a lot of it deals with uh, the, the families and the founders of these companies. If you look at uh, Starbucks, one of the principal reasons, and I was uh, on the board of Starbucks for many, many years in, in the early days, and I worked with Howard to build the management team and build the employee um, benefit packages and things like that. So why did Starbucks end up to be so uh, compassionate to its employees? Howard Schultz uh, had lived through a, a series of things with his family in the East, and it reflected he, you know, not in my backyard. He wasn't going to let that happen. And also he knew me, and he saw the, the, the value system that we had infused into Costco. I had seen what the Nordstrom's had done relative to customer service. I knew all of that stuff. Um, and we all kind of fed off of each other. And, and that, that goes back also, I think, to the Boeing situation back in the uh, 60s. So that's amazing. So we have a community that feeds this culture, which seems to be almost polar opposite from what you get in the Northeast. So the Northwest has this unique approach. And, and it's global, so we're almost, you're almost taking a very specific regional focus and culture and spreading it around the world almost as an antithesis to the Wall Street culture. Yes, and we, uh, if we've, I've been told many, many times, we, there's no need to do this in Japan or there's no need to do this in Korea or in Australia and all the countries that we operate in. And you can't sell hot dogs in Japan. Uh, pizzas in the food court will never sell. Uh, in Japan, they told us that you can't sell dinner rolls because people don't use dinner rolls, and you can't have really sweet, gooey stuff because they don't eat it. And, and we just what happened? well, we are so simple, and we don't we only know one way. I love your focus. <laughs> <laughs> we just opened up. We, our feeling was is that we could get started in those countries and see what happened. And and the number one seller in Japan in the bakery is dinner rolls. <laughs> so um, and. We have huge hot dog business in the food courts and things like that. Oh, so these it. things, uh, not only are we not adapting to Japanese culture, they want American culture, and that seems to be uh, the key. Now, well, relative to t uh, the way we treat our employees in all those countries, that is different. And we can afford to do a lot more in those countries than we can here because of health care costs yeah. are are lower. Well, I look forward to, t you've stuck to your guns, I look forward to discussing our next segment about how, what your legacy might be based on everything that you've built. We'll be right back with Jeff Brock. Four Peaks is made possible by generous support from the Museum of History and Industry and from Weber Shandwick. We're back with entrepreneur and philanthropist Jeff Brotman. Jeff, as you look at all you've accomplished, both at Costco and in terms of the philanthropy that you've done with you and your wife, um, what's next for you? What do you hope that people will recognize you for? Well, I mean, we've always, uh, my, wife and I, my wife Susan and I have always felt that uh, what we have acquired in material wealth was transitory uh, to, to us, and we expect to give all of it back to the community in one way or the other. So that, that guiding principle was always with us. Um, in terms of legacies, uh, you know, th that's a difficult question for somebody like me. I, I am very, very proud of uh, what we've been able to do in terms of tr the way we treat our employees at Costco and, uh, and any of the other companies that I've been associated with. I think that uh, my legacy will be that that uh, we've established employment policies that allow people to have a great life and a great standard of living and to 
live their lives and be able to give back to the community. So that, that is my strongest legacy. Uh, that's up there with uh, two kids who are great kids and uh, also retailers. <laughs> um, your co-founder, Jim Senegal, uh, retired a, a couple of years back. Um, we look at, say, a company like Apple, where Steve Jobs had left a profound uh, impact, but is also changing. Uh, how can you be assured that your values will continue at Costco when you're no longer at the helm, leading them all the way, along the way? Well, I th in our case, we did something that was also unusual from the very beginning. We only hired from within. Uh, we, didn't, we have one MBA who is our vice president of uh, finance, uh, who's been with us. That's the for, only MBA you have? The in only, well, <laughs> the only uh, non-homegrown MBA. We, we support uh, kids who want to go to college and get advanced degree, any degree, including MBAs. But we don't go outside of the company and hire um, MBAs. We don't hire anybody from outside the company for anything. We have no consultants. We don't do any of that. You don't advertise. <laughs> we don't advertise. We don't do a lot of things that are considered essential to running an American business. Um, so what we did is we hired only from within, and the culture of our company is buried deep down inside the company. So on any given day, if somebody's in uh, Korea working in a warehouse and there's a, uh, an issue that has to be resolved, they know what our culture is, uh, whether that's in the UK, whether it's in the United States, wherever. They, they know what the right answer is. Now, of course, whether they take the right steps uh, to get to the right answer is another question. When you have 185,000 employees, uh, it's difficult to ensure that that's going to happen. But everyone in, uh, everyone in Issaquah, our home offices, certainly knows uh, what the corporate culture is. Well, Jeff Brotman, your willpower and your vision truly do make you an innovator, and I hope that your legacy does persist. And we invite you all to extend your reach by connecting with us at fourpeaks.org. I'm Hanson Hossein. Thanks for joining us. Production of Four Peaks would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors.